Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, first I want to start off by saying that the choir is now back together, and we are going to change the time from choir uh, for choir practice. It's going to be Thursday nights now at five o'clock, so it's easier to get here and get home before dark. Uh, the cantata. If anybody wants to join, we're still looking for people who have a nice singing voice or a bad singing voice that want to join us. We are also looking for people that would like to do speaking parts. The cantata starts on Thursday nights at 6 o'clock, right after regular practice. October 28th is the yard sale, $15 a space. We are having our bake sale the same day. If anybody wants to bake anything for it, it's a good fundraiser. November 4th is the church conference. Um, it's at 9 o'clock at First United Methodist Church. Um, November the 15th, we're having our Thanksgiving luncheon. Bring anything that you would like to serve to your family for Thanksgiving, you can bring it here, and we'll have our nice luncheon. Um, we're also going to start collecting for uh, the food pantry at St. Mary's for Thanksgiving. We call it Harvest Home. We put it all up here on the altar, and then I'll take it over the week before Thanksgiving. Um, the last Sunday that we're going to be collecting the food donations is going to be the 19th, because we have to get the food over to them before they start giving out the turkeys and the canned goods and stuff. Um, November 12th, Mary has announced that there will be a frog meeting right after church. Okay, okay thank you. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer. Lord, we um, gather this morning, a lot of thoughts go through our mind. It's a beautiful day outside, but our <coughs> relationship with the Lord doesn't depend on the weather outside, it's what's in our heart. I pray as we gather this morning to hear the message, to sing the songs, to hear the choir pieces. I just pray, Lord, that it draws closer to you. Lord, I know you were busy, but we need to make time for the Lord. So now, Lord, just speak to us and draw us closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Grace to Faith is the Nicene Creed, number 880. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God, true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified for Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Unless we unlock 
that information that's stored within these people, that library is going to disappear. And the stories are going to disappear. And the lessons that we need to learn from each other are going to disappear. But if, if we try, like you and I go shop, right, and we meet strange people there, and we talk to them, and we learn things, that's what I'm asking you to do. Reach out to, uh, and you don't have to be up in your 60s, 70s, or 80s. Some of these young people have got some stories that they, they really need to pass on so that the generations coming up behind can be forewarned or educated. They don't have to travel those same roads. They can create their new stories. So just remember that every person that passes away, a book disappears. And if we, if we don't keep in touch with the, the soul and the information that <coughs> is gathered through them, right? We're not going to have any libraries anymore. That's just how I kind of feel. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I just feel that the when the elderly people are babbling, I think we need to listen. And we need to take those stories and truly pass them on. Not as gossiping, but to help the people behind us get through the roads that we've already passed through. That's what I, you know, that's what I took from this session that I had on Saturday. So uh, I'd like to hear from you after church if, if you agree or if you can set my mind clear, but that, that's just how I felt on Saturday. We need to love each other better, deeper, and stronger. Amen. 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 Um, let's have prayers for our granddaughter. She's going to be operated on Tuesday. She works in the emergency room, and she was helping a patient off the table, and he fell on her, and she's had pain ever since. So hopefully this will help her. What's your first name? Rachel. Rachel. I remember that. Okay. Prayers also for Tom. Yes. Yeah. He was missing. Tom fell. Uh, there was construction on the road and on Williamstown Raddox Road. He was edging towards the podiatrist the there and uh, couldn't get through. So we parked this car in, in the TG Bank and decided to walk to the place. Now, it's only a block and a half, but to Tom, with his unsure footing, right. that's a long distance. Yeah. And he fell. Right by the police officer, I think. You know, right. if the police officer, thank God the police officer was there because he called 911. Right. So he, uh, he broke the, his glass. He went right down on his face and he took a chunk out of his, um, part of his nose, he said. He's home. Helen gave him instructions. He's not to drive for a couple of days, right, Helen? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I got to the door yesterday and he said, I know Fred's gonna pick up my truck and I would like to go with him. I'm driving it home and I thought, Lord, put your words on my lips right now, but in a gracious way. And I stood there and said, Tom, I'm so sorry, but you're not gonna drive, darling. I talked to Pastor, I'm sorry I included you. <laughs> and I said, and we, we agreed you should rest for a few days. Here's a platter and he went, thank you. No argument, no nothing. He knew he has a patch on the bridge of his nose, a few scrapes across the forehead in his hand, but he said he's okay. He was scared more than anything, but the hospital did a CT scan. He's okay. And he agreed that Fred can drive the truck home, put it in the driveway, and I can keep the keys for a couple days. You know Tom. So I, he, and he thanks everybody for thinking of him, praying for him. And he said uh, his words, I'm so sorry I, w I couldn't make it today, meaning yesterday. And I'm so sorry, would you tell pastor, I, I don't think I can make church tomorrow. And I said, Tom, we know that. Dear. So 
Okay, but he's good. Yeah. yeah. When he called me from the hospital, that was the first person he told me to tell yeah. was Pastor. <laughs> Yeah. Ever tell Pastor that um, he won't open up the <laughs> yeah. and then let him know I'm home. Mm -hmm. That's one night. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, yeah. Anyone else? Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. Um, I'd like to have prayers for my uh, former co-worker. She passed away from cancer. She was 72 years old, but her name is Rosetta, and it's the Long family. And she knew the Lord, and she was she knew that her time was coming to an end. And she said to me, she would see me on the other side. One unspoken prayer. Okay, one prayer. Yes. I have a phrase. <laughs> Good. We could, we could use one right now. <laughs> I, he asked me a few months back what I wanted for my birthday. He said, This is right after Christmas. And I said, I just want to party. And I really didn't. <laughs> but oh my gosh, and, it, and he threw a party for me to everybody that was there, my friends, my family. He had a DJ. It was, I was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was my 80th party, so I made it before I died. <laughs> I heard how they got you there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally <laughs> super. <laughs> that works. <laughs> Richard come in the, in the fellowship hall and he went, she wants to go by herself. I said, hurry up and get in that car. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't believe it. I'm still, I'm still shocked. Yeah. It's awful. I'm so happy for you. It's always hard to get uh, people to a place you went to without letting them know what's going on. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyone else? Okay, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, uh, we gather down here today on the Sabbath day. The world we live in is a crazy place. And we know what's happening in Israel with the war and everything. And this is a serious situation. And we just pray, Lord, your will will be done. And ultimately, good will triumph over evil. For this time period, we wonder sometimes. We don't want to question you, Lord, but sometimes it's sense to our way of thinking. But the ways of God are higher than our ways and thoughts far above ours, for you know what's best. We pray that prayer at the end, according to your will. Sometimes we struggle with that. we got to let go and let God work in our lives. For you know exactly what we're supposed to do. You can give us the guidance we need. Our country needs your guidance, the world needs your guidance. And now, Lord, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, may that remind us that at any time we can come to you in prayer. As we pray the prayer you taught us, our Father, our Lord, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of ever have. Amen. Our next hymn is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 133. 133. <laughs>
relationship to God in Christ. In difference whereby Christians are distinguished from others that are not baptized, but it is also a sign of regeneration of new birth. The articles of religion John Wesley asserted, baptism is not only a sign of professing and the mark of difference between Christians and distinction from others. They are not baptized, but also a sign of infant powerful portraits and the utter dependency of all we all have on God. The sacrament is a sign of God's promise of ongoing grace or of continual forgiveness and transformation through our lives. Baptism demonstrates our inclusion in the covenant with God and our access to divine grace that claims and sustains and serves us. I have a couple questions I'm going to ask you. Do you desire to be baptized in the Christian faith? Okay. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil in whatever form it may present themselves? Do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as the Lord in union with the, with the church? which Christ has opened to people of all ages and nations. I do. If you would kneel on the kneel, then I would pray. Okay. Robert, I baptize in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, I just thank you for Robert coming forward today to profess his faith in Jesus. And Lord, you know this world is a crazy place, but we know Jesus Christ is Savior. We don't have to worry. We ask your blessing upon Rob now in your name we pray. Amen. 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 I have a certificate for you. Oh, I'll give you when you take the membership. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we have six people going to join, so come up and if you would queue up across the front here. Thank you.
First is united professing members of the local United Methodist Church. They profess their faith in God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And, and um, thus they make known their desire to live their lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. And now he asks you two simple questions and say, I do. Do we see and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of both the Old and the New Testament? Yeah. You promise to live according to the grace given you to keep God's holy will and commands and walk in the same all the days of your life. And uh, I say to the congregation, brothers and sisters, I commend you your love and care of these persons whom we this day receive in the membership of New Hope and the United Methodist Church. And they have a suitable for framing certificate. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
in a new language. <laughs> Family is a very important thing, and uh, you begin to realize it uh, the older you get, the important. It's funny how as you get older, you realize what really matters. And you talk about older people, there's a lot of wisdom. Most cultures revere the elderly for the wisdom they have. Mm -hmm. Somehow in America, we've got away from that, and that's really a shame. Our text today, uh, sermon is entitled, How Thirsty Are You? And the question is, how thirsty are you to draw closer to God? Psalm 63, the first eight verses I'd like to read. A Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, thou art my God, I seek thee, my soul thirsts for thee, my flesh faints for thee, as in a dry and weary land where no water is. So I looked upon thee in the sanctuary, behold thy power and glory, because thy steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise thee, so I will bless thee as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on my name. My soul feasts as with marrow and fat. My mouth praises thee with joyful lips. When I think of thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the watches of the night. For thou hast been my help, in the shadow of my wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to thee, thy right hand upheld me. Let those who seek to destroy my life serve them down the depths of earth, and they shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be prey for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall glory, for the mouth of liars be stopped. Let us pray. Lord, I pray now that speak through me. I'm just a mere man, but use me, Lord, and may the message we need to hear come forth. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, when you look at the Psalms, you can kind of tell that, especially David, he's really crying out. He really struggles. Have any of you struggled with God lately? Anybody? I have. Hasn't been a, the last couple months for me have been kind of tough. You know, I lost my best friend and um, one of them was down to a few, but as you get older, people do pass away. And of course, the anniversary of my brother's death in two years was happening to be on my second son's birthday. But have you ever really wanted something so bad that you were willing to go all the way with it? I always uh, like playing baseball, I, I like the sport, I like to watch it. Um, and years ago, I wanted to get a hit as hard as I could. So I took a, a board and put a stake through it, and I took an old washing machine hose that are stiff, mm. and I cut it off about this high, and I put a baseball on it, and I hit it. I didn't realize why I invented T-ball. <laughs> years later, I, I, my kids said, that's my intention. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had, um, you want to learn how to throw, so uh, you're short people uh, in kind of the neighborhood. So we need a first baseman. Bill Scalver at that time was the first baseman for the Yankees. So we've got this washed tub. Well, actually, we took it without telling my mom. And uh, we set it up over there, and that was Scalver. So when he got the ball, if you threw it and hit the wash tub, he was out. I practiced when we weren't playing throwing at a wash tub. I was really good at wash tub throwing. <laughs> <laughs> I really was. And my mother said, why is my big pan dented? <laughs> we beat that thing to death. But the desire to do that, to go hard after God, to say, I want all that God can give me in my life. We do it for other things. We work hard to, for a new job, a promotion. Spot on that starting team. Right. A car we always wanted. Uh... A weight loss goal, I'm going to skip that one, that's a tough one. <laughs> you do your best to get what you want. You give it your best effort, focus all your energies, think about it day and night. Devise a plan of strategy. Talk to anyone who would listen. Stick to it until you accomplish it. We all have those kinds of pursuits in life. They're what we live for. A sense of purpose and accomplishment. What would happen if every Christian person gave their 100% effort to going after God. Think about it. What would happen to individuals, families, a church? 
wouldn't have a lot of trivial things going on if we focused on God and God only. What changes might take place? We'd see an increase in prayer life, our priorities, which I always struggle with. How do we use our time, our spending habits, our social life, our church attendance, our burden for the loss? Do we have a burden for the loss? How are you going to handle that this morning? Our mission, our commitment. We could turn our world, our community, upside down. Think about that. We have, as a nation, been so blessed. We really have. Think about all the things that we have today, all the conveniences we have. You look over in these other countries, you see some of the scenes over there that's taking place in that yeah. war zone? It's horrible. Can you imagine losing everything you ever owned? Everything. And we could send it somebody puts a scratch in our car. We go, look what they do to my new car. How dare them do that? Those people will never even own a car. Or if it is, you see all the car that burned up? To lose everything in a place God's promised land. What's going on? You're right, Denise, about praying about it. And you know why? Because I'll tell you, things are happening at such a rapid rate. When will the time end? I don't see how much longer this world can continue unless something changes. When Jesus was born, he came, was born in the stable, actually a little cave actually, and uh, the world didn't even know it happened. But the Bible tells us he'll come again. Because when he ascended, they said, this Jesus will return again in like manner. You can guarantee it. Everything in the Bible has come true, and now we're at the end of time. When will it be? I don't know. No one knows the hour. You know, Jesus even said that only the Father knew. My brother used to joke about that and say, that's got to be the most guarded secret in the history of the world. It's such a secret that the Father wouldn't tell Jesus for fear he'd blab to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and everybody would begin to know. think about that. So we don't know the hour. We don't need to know the hour. But we need to know that it will happen when Christ decides it's time. And you can guarantee this. Years ago, I was in a bookstore, a used bookstore, and I came across this book, and it talked about the author's idea was that you had to be careful trying to. He felt people misinterpreted the book of Revelation. And his thesis was, he said, I think you're kind of mistaken to think that Israel has to become a nation for prophecy to be fulfilled. Because he said it looks highly unlikely that Israel will ever become a nation you know, in, a, in the near future. The book was dated 1947. The book wasn't too good after 1948. For Israel became a nation. How could that happen? Because the Lord said, My people will return to the land I promised them. You know what? It's happened. I've been over there. And uh, it's all starting to come into place. Psalm 63 tells what happens when you go after God. David, to me, sets kind of three requirements that you can sum them up in three words. I always like to do this once in a while. Reference, resource, and resolution. And I'll talk about that this morning. There was one time an absent-minded professor, this was not me though, well, I could probably qualify, he became so absorbed in his work he forgot the simplest details. Maybe this is about me. One morning his wife said now, now Henry, remember, we're moving today. I'm putting a note in your pocket, don't forget. The day passed by, the man came home to his house. He entered the front door and found the place was empty. Distraught, he walked to the curb and sat down. A young guy walked up to him and he asked the little boy, Do you know the people who used to live here? The boy replied, Sure, Dad. Mother told me you forget. <laughs> now that's bad. I haven't quite got to that point. Being the psalm tells us this. When he was in the desert of Judah, David knew too well where he was at. The desert, the wilderness. Verse 1 describes it as a dry and weary land, 
a parched and thirsty land where there was no water, a very difficult place to be. When we read the Bible, we do have to consider the context and begin to understand the audience was written to. And sometimes that can be dangerous going the other way and say it doesn't apply anymore. But in this case, when he used the term dry and weary land, a parched and thirsty land, these people lived in a dry climate. They knew exactly what it was like. It was more powerful. We think, well, we've been thirsty, but we're talking about a, a thirst that just is almost overwhelming. And so he's admitting his own need for God. They've been messed up at times, we all do. But you know one thing, he knew the situation, but he knew the only solution to a situation was to serve God. I believe today within the Christian church, many are in a place, a spiritually dry place. How did they get there? You know, you wonder about, we look at life and we start to take things, I know none of you have ever taken things for granted. Uh, we do this all the time. But you know, um, I'm, I'm very patriotic, you know that, uh, the Navy officer and all that stuff. And, and um, I, uh, I got the best deal not too long, but I have a flag in my backyard and I like to have it there all the time. So I bought a floodlight on it. The floodlights are expensive. I went to one place, it was 12 bucks for the light. I was like, whoa, that's a lot of money for a light bulb. And then at the Habitat Humanity Place in Pittman, somebody donated these lights, the nice ones. I bought them all. Every month I will buy more of them. I figured out that um, the bulb was box will outlive me and probably my children. I have a ton of these things. But when I looked out last night, I saw this flag just lit up so beautiful. It kind of stirs my heart. But as much as that flag means a lot to me and many of many of you in this room, I think when my family came over here to this country and when they put their hand up and became an American citizen, I don't think I'll ever know quite the joy that they knew. Would you agree? Because it was something to them very, very special. We, as a church, we've kind of got used to things. I don't think we see the urgency of the need of sharing our faith with others. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube that uh, <clears throat> is not the best stuff, but uh, uh, this particular person, I, I, he was kind of strong. He, he was really, I won't say names, but he was kind of downing some big name preachers, and we're not into downing anybody. If you're preaching the gospel, I'm not going to down you. Um, but he was really hitting pretty hard on that. But he was talking about lack of commitment, how we don't hunger, in, and he said, we don't hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why don't we have that desire to share our faith with others? Do we really take the gospel serious? He said the problem is today, when uh, you know we we go to the church, we don't say what what can the church do for me, but uh, you know what, what can you do for me? Not what can I do for it? Uh, a couple of churches back had a couple of start to attend, so I made a point to go see them, and um, they're very cordial people. And they had gone to this little church for a long, long time. And um, I said, they moved up our way. And I said, uh, <clears throat> it's a little bit of a distance, but they said, well, that's really not the reason we're leaving. Uh, people today drive miles to get here. I, I drive 20 miles to get here. A lot of people do that. I'm not the only one who do that. But the thing they were telling me was, they said, we were so involved. We had so much we had to do on all these committees and stuff. And we've been to your service. and." Uh, it's a large congregation, you got a good choir, and uh, the music's kind of entertaining. It's immediately bothered me. I thought, oh no. And basically to sum it up, they said, we'll attend, give us some envelopes, we'll put some money in the plate, but don't ask us to do anything. I just want to come to church and have a nice service I can enjoy. And that bothered me a lot. And I started to pray for those people. And they were good members, they were generous with money. But I thought, you know, they're coming here because we entertain better than the previous church. I didn't like that at all. So I prayed for them people. And one day she came to me, we're having Bible school. And she said, have you been praying for me? I thought, yeah. She said, I think I know how you've been praying. 
you look, you, you look pray when you get involved. Because he knew I ran Bible school at the last church. I said, yeah, I checked it out, checked it out. And he transferred here. <laughs> I asked him, but we'll know, what, how, what was their involvement in your church? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I really do want to get involved with this. It's, it's time that I start saying, uh, I don't want to come to church to be entertained. I want to be in this church because I can serve the Lord Jesus. They're still in that church 26 years later. And you know, that's that's so very, very important to do that, you know. So it's uh, Revelation 3.17 says, We say, I am rich, I am prospered, I need nothing, not knowing that you are wretched, poor, blind, and naked. It's kind of a strong statement to say the least. But you know what? I think so many times we get we get we get comfortable. I've struggled the last three years, I was here 10 years, I've struggled over the years, how long should I stay here? And I keep telling myself this statement, which you should never say, I have done enough. It's time for somebody else to do it. That's not the right kind of attitude. And you think, and I remember I was talking to another pastor about that, and, and I said, well, when am I going to have time to relax, retire, and not have to be in charge, involved with anything. And he said, uh, do you know Christ as Savior? Yeah. He said, now what's your problem? I said, what do you mean what's my problem? What are you trying to tell me? He said, when you know Christ, you have eternal life. You will have all of eternity to relax. And one good thing about being a minister is you'll be out of work. <laughs> Because absent from the bodies and presence of the Lord, you won't need to ever preach a sermon again. Because you won't need the sermon. You'll be in the presence of the Lord. So actually, it made me feel really lousy about myself. <laughs> you know, I started to wonder about that. I don't think we communicate enough with God. People say, "How do you know when God's speaking to you? How can how can you hear His voice?" I went out and said. Today I had a half hour conversation with God. Mmm, you did, huh? You heard his voice? It kind of looks like you're weird, you know. But um, you know what? You can. The telephone rings, a young mother answers. Honey, it's mom. I called because I know that you're busy and with three children, and I want to give you some time, some help. I'm gonna stop by and clean your house, take care of the baby, prepare dinner for the boys when they get home. And uh, I want you to go to, to my beautician. Beautician, yeah, that's it. And um, I made an appointment for you. You're to be there at 1 o'clock. She'll have you all dolled up. Give George a call at the office and tell him that you will meet him in your favorite restaurant for dinner. It's on me. The young mother suddenly interrupts and says, George, who is George? <laughs> your husband, says the caller. My husband's Fred. <laughs> I was in the part of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she replies, is this 555-3212? Five, 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 two, two? No, it's 555-2212. Five, 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 two, two, two. I'm sorry. I seem to have the wrong number, says the embarrassed caller. After the pause, the young mother asks, does that mean you're not coming over? <laughs> wow. Think about that. Now, we can laugh at that, but in a spiritual aspect, it isn't funny. Immediately, she should have recognized the voice and known it was a wrong number. When my mother used to call me a lot, she didn't say, Hi, Bob Ralph, this is your mother, I mean Ralph. <laughs> no, no. As soon as the phone, I would call her, I even call friends. As soon as I say hello, they know it's me for some reason. <laughs> but I know the voice. But sometimes when I don't pray, I don't read the Bible enough. I don't recognize the voice of God. And I think as a country, as a church, we're guilty of that. My question is to you, how well do you know, it, know the voice of God? David acknowledges God as my God. To know God, that's what has to happen. David acknowledged him as his only hope, our only resource. Our situation in this world is hopeless. But if you let the Lord do it, it won't be hopeless. You see, we're going to find out that 
I believe as a country, we're in the wilderness, a dry place. And I think our own denomination and many other mainline churches are spiritually weary and dry. And we're not recognizing the voice of God. If we were hearing the voice of God as a nation, I believe things would be far different than they are. I really believe that. We need God's help. Psalm 18, 6 says, In my distress, I call upon the Lord. To my God, I cry for help. For his temple, he heard my voice. My cry to him reaches his ears. Think about it. In distress. Are we in distress? As a nation, we really are. Never has this country been so divided. The stuff that's going on right now in our own government. What is happening? You know what, though? It can change. So what's our resolution? Seek God. I want to say this, that uh, part of verse 1 says, I will seek thee. Because David realized that was his only hope. I think this phrase means that we, make, we need to make God our first priority. I shared this a long time ago. Since a lot of you are old, maybe you'll forget it. But it doesn't sound new. But um, I remember my friend's church in Bradford, the Methodist church in town. We, like, we carpooled a lot. And uh, he took me to tour the, of the of this building. Boy, show your building to other pastors. And in the children's Sunday school room were these two posters. And it was a picture of a throne. And it had a person sitting on the throne. And it had all kinds of things surrounding it. You know, God and Bible. All good things. But the second poster had it all in a neat order. And sitting on the throne was Jesus Christ. I said, that's quite a poster. He said, yeah, we're going to put some of them in the adult class too. Think of that. I said, maybe we should put them in our seminary class over ourselves. He said, you know, you're right. I think so many times I want to be on the throne. I want the things of God, but Jesus has to be on the throne. Earnestly I seek you. In my heart I long for you. Do you long for God? My whole being desires. I can't get enough of you. Did you say, I just can't get enough of God. I can't get enough of Jesus. I sure wish you would. Verse 1 says, my soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this parched and weary land where there is no water. But Jesus is the living water. That's why he says, my whole body longs for you. That's really wanting God. Every cell of my body cries out for you for refreshment. I can't live without you. Um, a lot of times when you listen to music, uh, especially from the 50s and 60s, it's got a good beat to it. But I, anymore lately, I like to listen to the words and really listen to them. And many a love song says, I can't live without you. A woman will say that to the man she loved, vice versa. But I'm going to tell you right now, I cannot live without Jesus Christ in my life. It's impossible. And I've struggled and struggled a lot. But you know what? Just the human body needs food for energy. We need spiritual food. And we really need it. I think I have to say, in some times of recent, I've been on a spiritual diet. You know, when you don't eat and lose weight, when you don't have spiritual food, guess what? Your relationship starts to dwindle. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Are you hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Have you come to a place in your pursuit for the Lord? As John 4, 34 says, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. That's so very, very important. Has our hunger for God dwindled as a nation? You know, we, we talk about we blame the pandemic for everything. You know, churches are down and closed because of the pandemic. I think even with the government, we've been using the pandemic for every excuse when something fails. But you know something? I think it's time to say what we failed is 
we've lost our hunger for the Lord. Part of the problem in the pandemic, we were isolated for so long. It's really been a, a tough time. It has been directly been affected children, including one of my grandchildren, who has definitely been affected by that, her social skills with others. And it's really sad because it, it, it is a tough thing. I think, though, a lot of times they say the problem is we haven't communicated with each other. But I think a lot of times we haven't communicated with the Lord. You see, we need to have that. That thing we laughed about, you know, uh, I have the wrong number. That never should have been. And although it may give a laugh as a story, it's no laughing matter. Because how long did that conversation go on? Where she realized when the name was wrong, that it's not the right number. You should, if you pray, read your Bible, you'll begin to understand it's the voice of God. If you ever try to learn another language, that's when people try to learn English, it's difficult. And, and, you, and you struggle to, to learn because you, you, the mindset is different. Uh, English thinks different than most other languages. So you got to get the mindset for it. Remember when we were in Israel, this person spoke four languages and they were doing it different from us. And so I said, when they speak, so they, well, are they thinking, what language are they thinking in? I said, obviously you only know the English language. You said, that's the only language I know. I said, yeah, that's, that's a statement you would make. No, when they're speaking, they're thinking in the thought process of that language. We need to understand when God is talking to us, we really do. And that, that's, that's vitally important, you know? So when he says, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God, but can you say in Matthew 5, 6, are you hungry and thirst for righteousness? When you do, you'll be satisfied. I think we've been too satisfied with a mediocre religion a lot of times. And I'm just as good as anybody else. A message like this kind of produces several spots. Probably the three, three groups. There's one group that says, Pastor, don't get yourself all worked up. Don't rock the boat. We like it the way it is. Don't expect anything different from us. Yeah, we don't like change in churches. And that's why they cross all denominations too. You know that? <laughs> we, all agree with we do that. Another group says, Pastor, that sounds good. I can see that it would really make a difference. Hope some other members get on board with you. But I know from experience that something like that is <coughs> a lot of work. I just don't have time to get involved right now. And lastly, Nevertheless, fortunately, there's another group who says, Pastor, this is just what I need. In fact, this is just what I need. Moreover, I want it. Whatever it is, you can count on me. So which group are you? And that's not just for lay people, but that goes to pastors too and any kind of church leaders. Are you really want to really get on board with God? Are you satisfied with your level of commitment? I am not, as I stand here this morning, satisfied with my level of commitment. What will it take to move you to a level of true commitment? Are you willing to pay the price? And I have to ask myself the same question. Because you know what? Think what's happening in our world. You might be the difference between a person knowing Jesus and not knowing Jesus. And like you say, the Lord will send you there. I don't know how to win a person to Christ. I've never won a person to Christ, but I've shared a message in the spirit, dealt with them, and they accepted Jesus. But folks, I'm not one of those doomsday preachers that said the Lord's going to end tomorrow. But I do think this planet is running out of time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's time that it may not be the most comfortable thing to think about, but we better start to pray to make the best use of our time. We want to be like David and cry out, cry out for the Lord. You know, you know, it says this, Oh God, thou art my God, I seek thee when my soul thirsts for thee. I flesh face for thee as a dry and weary land where there is no water. Think about it. Are you hungry for the Lord? How thirsty are you? Our closing hymn is, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And that should be our testimony, number 170.
bluegrass music tonight. Oh yeah, that's right, yeah. Before it's sunny.